Oddball Show features content intended for mature audiences. If you'd like to view a content warning before listening, please check out the episode description. The views put forth by our hosts and our guests reflect the speaker's opinions and not the official stance of Oddball Foundation. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy the show. Jason, psychiatry decided we're going to become a laboratory science. We're only going to pay attention to things that be quantified. When they did that, they turned their back on human nature. Mental illness has, take, has taken on a kind of mysterious, kind of alien, kind of weird, kind of characteristic. No, it's simple. Mental illness is very simple. If you're a human being and you can't love the way you want to love, you can't be connected with other people in satisfying ways. You know, if human beings can't do those things, if they can't connect with other people, they can't express themselves, they're going to become mentally ill, especially if they have no hope. Hey, everybody, it's Jason Wright from Oddball Show. I'm here with Al Galvez. Al is the president of Mind Freedom International, a nonprofit organization that brings together individuals and groups in the fight for rights and alternative modes of treatment for folks deemed mentally ill. He holds a PhD in psychology, has years of experience in treatment, fundraising, and organizing, and we are really excited to get his perspective on a number of important issues today. Al, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, good to be here, Jason. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you about things. So first, I'd like to talk about like what Mind Freedom International is and what is your mission? Mind Freedom International is, a, uh, is an organization that advocates for human rights in mental health. So what do we mean by that? We mean people should not be forced into treatment, into mental health treatment. That is a violation of human rights. So to be involuntarily committed to a hospital or to be forcibly treated, it's just a horrible violation of human rights. Uh, Mind Freedom was started by a guy named David Oakes, who uh, grew up in a Lithuanian uh, neighborhood, working class neighborhood in, in Chicago, and went to Harvard, right? And he had a breakdown in his freshman year at Harvard, and they, they took him to the hospital and they injected Haldol. And he said, after that experience, he said, no, no more of that shit. No. Well, they put him into solitary confinement. They punished him. He said, okay, that's it. You know, and pretty much dedicated himself to spend his life, part of his life, fighting against that kind of thing. And he, he started Mind Freedom, 1985. Uh, here's what we do. We do a number of things. One thing we do, we have what, what's called a Mind Freedom Shield, Jason. Basically, the Mind Freedom Shield is it's a solidarity network of people who agree to help each other if they are involuntarily committed to treatment. So when a person is involuntarily committed, they notify the, the Mind Freedom Shield, and then members, they call the psychiatrist, they'll call uh, the, the, uh, the, the hospital administrator, they'll call the nurses, the nurses station. They, they raise hell with the legislators, with the governor, just say, hey, this isn't right. You know, this is just against fundamental human rights. And it's against the, the convention, the United States Convention on the Treatment of, of People with Disabilities, too, which the United States is a signatory to. So th that's what the Mind Freedom Shield does. Some of the things that we've done, there was a guy named Ray Sanford uh, who was, he was living in Minneapolis. This is maybe about 15 years ago, Jason, 15, 20 years ago. He was being electroshocked against his will, right? You know, people from the hospital would come on Wednesday they pick him up and they go electroshock him. In other words, put a thousand volts of electricity through his brain. And he didn't want them to do that. And his mother didn't want him to do it either, but he was court ordered for treatment. So they were doing, it, you know? So this is a big problem. You know, about 1.2 million people every year in the United States are involuntarily committed. You know, in a way you would say involuntary treatment is, a, is an oxymoron because if a person doesn't want to be treated, it's very unlikely that they're going to benefit from treatment. And you may know this, that, you know, there've been a lot of studies of psychotherapy, right? Mm -hmm. And how does psychotherapy work and what kinds work better than others? Well, it turns out that it really doesn't make any difference what technique is being used. What makes a difference in psychotherapy is the relationship between the patient and the therapist. That's what makes the difference. 
Well, obviously, if you've got a, somebody involuntarily committed against their will to treatment, there's not going to be much of a relationship between the therapist and the patient. So, so that's that's one thing we do. The other thing we do is we, we we answer the question, well, look, if you don't like involuntarily treatment, and we also, we, we don't think psychiatric drugs are very good treatment for, for a mental illness either, Jason. Uh, and we certainly think people ought to have more of a choice. You know, they ought to have a, a lot of choices about the kind of treatment they, they receive. So we answer the question, well, if you don't like involuntary commitment and forced treatment and, and psychiatric medication, what do you like? So we put on workshops, we put on conferences, we, we promote alternatives like soteria houses, like open dialogue, the open dialogue approach, like uh, hearing voices network, like um, intentional peer support, like peer run crisis respite houses, uh, like, like the RAP program. And so we advocate for those, those kinds of approaches. And um, basically, so those, those are the, the two main things we do. David, David also did some other things that were wonderful. Um, he would organize protests against the American Psychiatric Association. Our main problem with the American Psychiatric Association was that the only thing they had to offer was medication, right? They didn't have anything else to offer. And it seemed like that, come on, you know, give people a choice so they can have something other than medication. That shouldn't be the only thing that you're pushing. So he would organize protests. We'd go out there with bullhorns. And and the other thing he did was he he started a Mad Pride. Uh, we would have Mad Pride events every year. Basically go to a park, have a bunch of clowns, uh, speakers, bed pushes, people having a good time, you know. The whole idea of mad pride, the whole idea of let's not look at what we call madness. Let's not look at schizophrenia or psychotic disorders. Let's not look at them as there's something wrong with a person. Yeah, we could say may, maybe they're ill in some ways, you know, because maybe they can't function so well in the world, you know, when they're in a psychotic episode. Maybe it's hard for them to, to work or to, you know, relate to other people, but there's nothing wrong with them. What's going on with them is they found a way to survive. They've been hurt. They've been hurt pretty badly. They're terrified of the world and human beings. And, and, this, and this state of being they're in, this experience, is how they're surviving and moving towards healing and recovery. So we need to help them do that. That's what a Soteria House does, Jason. Here's the way Soteria works. Soteria is a home-like residence, six beds, nice kitchen area. A backyard, community room, people who are experiencing psychosis, and it was especially designed for people in their first break, they come, they come over there and the message they get is, come on in. You can stay here as long as you want. We're going to provide you with safety, support, and affirmation as you go through this experience. Because even though it's impairing, it's troubling, it's scary, it's weird maybe, this is how you're surviving and we're going to help you go through it. And uh, and as people would in, in Soteria, the first Soteria was in San Jose, California, and it was a research project of of the National Institute of Mental Health. There was a guy named Lauren Mosier who was the who was the psychiatrist in charge of of the schizophrenia project at the NIMH, and he said, you know, he could see what was happening with psychiatry, Jason. You can see they were going towards uh, towards the medical model, laboratory science, medicine, electroshock. He said, wait a second. He said, let's see if this works. And so he, that's what he did. He created a home-like residence and people would come in and, 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 and basically the staff would just be with them. And of course, it wasn't that easy, right? I mean, <laughs> you have a bunch of people who are going through that kind of experience. Sure, there are people who would be screaming and yelling, the people who thought other people wanted to kill them, people who would want to isolate for two weeks. There are all kinds of stories, you know, of people who have who have been in uh, the staff people in Soteria houses. There was a guy, he was a staff person at Soteria, and he was in an all-night all night diner with one of the patients. It's five in the morning, and they go outside, and the guy looks at Venus, and he says, yeah. He says, you know, they're coming down from Venus to pick me up tonight. They're coming down. 
And so this guy, his name was Gene Larkin, who was with the guy, he was a staffer. He said, okay, let's wait. So they waited. They waited, uh, you know, until, and then the sun came up and no one came down to pick him up. And he said, okay, let's go home. No big deal, right? So so they did, it. The, the National Institute of Mental Health did a good study. And what they did was they compared patients treated at Soteri with patients treated at the hospital. This is back in 19, between 1971 and 1983, Jason, a long time ago. So they did this study. And, and let me say one other thing. In the Soteria model, as people uh, stabilize, and typically that happens like six weeks, as people get stable, they're encouraged and helped to go out into the community, take a class, go to school, get a job, support an employment, volunteer, uh, go to therapy, support group, uh, art, recreation, encourage them to get out into the community and, and, and regain their life. So, okay, a good study's done, Jason. And um, so here's what they found. Patients were randomly assigned to Soteria or to the hospital. So two years after treatment ends, they go and they interview people. And what they found was that the people treated at Soteria were doing significantly better than the ones treated at the hospital in terms of social functioning, employment, rehospitalizations, and symptoms. They're doing significantly better. But the NIMH shut it down. They shut Soteria down. They buried that information and they fired Lauren Mosier. And it went into the black hole. So nobody at NIMH even knows about the Soteria project, even though it was successful, it was effective. Why would they do that? Well, the reason they did that because psychiatry was not going in that direction. Jason, psychiatry decided we're going to become a laboratory science. We're only going to pay attention to things that be quantified. We're going to be materialistic scientists. When they did that, they turned their back on human nature. So that's what psychiatry did. Psychiatry turned its back on human beings and became useless to human beings because you can't understand human beings or help them through materialistic science. How are you going to help a person love? love the way they want to love. This is what people need. You know, mental illness has, take, has taken on a kind of mysterious, kind of alien, kind of weird, kind of characteristic. No, it's simple. Mental illness is very simple. If you're a human being and you can't love the way you want to love, you can't be connected with other people in satisfying ways, you know, sexual love, romantic love, family love, collegial love, friendship, all kinds of love. If you can't connect with other human beings, and if you can't use your abilities, right, express yourself the way you do, you know this. You know how you how you recovered. You recovered by expressing your your uh, ability to write, to to imagine, to create. You know, if human beings can't do those things, if they can't connect with other people, they can't express themselves. They're going to become mentally ill, especially if they have no hope. Especially if they've lost hope and they don't think they ever will be able to. They're going to become manic, obsessive, compulsive, depressed, anxious, agoraphobic. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. So, you know, you can't, psychiatrists can't help human beings uh, because people can't learn to live with a pill. A pill may, may, may help them feel better, you know. I get it, and I, I respect people who use the medication. I really I really do, honest to goodness. It helps me. People say, you know, it helped me. But I got to tell you, there's a guy named Irving Kirsch. I don't know if you've ever heard of Irving Kirsch. I haven't. Irving Kirsch looked at all the research that was submitted by the drug companies to the FDA in the process of getting their antidepressants approved by the FDA. And what he found was that all of it, all in all except for the most severe depression, it was placebo effect. The people on the sugar pills did as well as the people on the antidepressants. You're kidding me. Exactly. It's now, all placebo. So that's antidepressants. Now, what about antipsychotics? They haven't done that kind of thing with antipsychotics, but but you know, antipsychotics are extremely toxic medications. Now, people don't get that information. You know, this is one of the problems informed consent. 
when psychiatrists prescribe these things, they, they don't give people good information about these drugs. And they don't get, tell them about the, op, the, the, the alternative they have, which is psychotherapy, some kind. But those drugs, let me tell you a little bit. You may know about them, maybe you don't. What, what antipsychotics do is they reduce dopamine in the brain. They attach to dopamine receptors and they cut down on the dopamine. They reduce dopamine in the brain. Well, dopamine is a very important neurotransmitter involved in reward, in creativity, in life, in liveliness. So as you know, people on those antipsychotics are really dumbed down. They are very powerful tranquilizers, sedatives. So they dumb people down and you know they, they have what they call side effects. Well, if you take those drugs for more than a year, for two, three years, you're going to get tardive dyskinesia, which is Parkinson-like disease, um, brain shrinkage, cognitive impairment, increased risk of diabetes, and early death, right? People who take neuroleptics die 25 years younger than other people. And the more neuroleptics they take, the earlier they die. So it's extremely toxic. And, you know, so people get this uh, tardive dyskinesia, which is um, like Parkinson's disease. What causes Parkinson's? Parkinson's is caused by a deficiency of dopamine. That's what causes Parkinson's disease. The medicine for Parkinson's disease is called L-dopa. It's synthetic dopamine. You're reducing dopamine in the person's brain. Well, sure, they're going to get Parkinson's symptoms. So it's going to happen. So what happened, because your question is wonderful, why did they shut down Soteria? because psychiatry was going towards materialistic science, laboratory science, and that's the way they went. And doing that, they became useless, basically essentially useless to human beings. Yeah, yeah, I 100% I, I agree with you. And, you know, it's to, to people who are on medications, and, and I imagine there's many people listening who are part of the medical model, uh, either you are part of the medical model, Probably if you've been to a psychiatrist, you're part of the medical model. If right. you've uh, uh, ever taken a medication, you might be part of the medical model. The the, the thing is, for me, I'll just talk about my experience. Yeah. Um, I'm on medications because okay. I actually tried to get off medications and then I was hospitalized because of a, a whole ripple effect of, uh, you know, I went to a seminar that was really amped me up. I was also doing uh, some different I was taking some other brain things at the same time, as well as doing neurofeedback and all sorts of things. So it wasn't the chicken or the egg. I was also lowering my meds. But really what I think happened is that I was trying to titrate too. I was too good at it that what I did was I cracked a cap, a crapped a pill that had a casing on it that when I cracked it in half, it was too small of a dose. It rendered it ineffective. So it was like I was taking no medications whatsoever. So anyway, there was ramifications of that and I was hospitalized and I definitely had to, uh, I had to eat that one. You know, I, 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 uh, I was hospitalized. I lost, I had a great foundation uh, team that I was building and they were all like, well, they went to their, you know, they, they found out that I got hospitalized and they went to their, their intern coordinator and they're like, well, our guy's in the hospital and they're like, you know, abandoned ship and that's fine. So I had to like lick my, lick my wounds and kind of get back. And I finally started to build, um, and I realized I came to a realization. Um, I just had a daughter and right now is not the time for me to lower my meds and, and mess with that. Um, I was so close though. And I almost kicked myself for being so close and that maybe I was too cautious that when my, when I was told to go to a certain level, I was like, no, I'm going to cut that in half. I'm going to go to this level. And when I cut the, when I cut the, um, the, the pill that had a coating on it, I think I rendered the pill ineffective. Um, right. Anyway, I, I was hospitalized and now I I had to fight back from what you're saying, like, you know, Haldol and things like that. I had to, I had to fight off of that. Um, right. And some of these other meds and, um, you know, the meds that were heavy, you know, and, and I'll say one other thing that, well, let me complete this thought. So I was on, I was, uh, you know, there was a very, very heavy med that I felt awful on, like absolutely awful. I would like kind of be driving and like, oh, you know, like get tired, you know, at 1030 in the morning and I was absolutely miserable and I hated myself. So I actually had to find a new psychiatrist who was really great psychiatrist. Um, and he was, he got me, he, you know, we tested, got back 
on the on something similar. And then you know what I added, Al? I added vitamin D. And ah. vitamin D made a huge difference in my mood. And that's just like a nice natural thing that maybe, you know, where I'm at, vitamin D just helped me with a little bit. I also take krill oil because I find it incredibly helpful for my brain and a right. multivitamin. So um, there is a way to, you know, and, and I also tried a bunch of other things, but now I'm just kind of simplifying, trying to remain uh, where I'm at for my daughter because I just had her. She's she's seven months old. So that's great. That. That's great. Truly really is good. And I said, you know, I uh, I get why people use medication and I understand that it works for people. You say, well, it makes me feel better. You know, I just feel a lot better and it saved my life. People say medication saved my life. And and if people want to want to use it, I mean, absolutely. They yeah. get good information about it. One of the problems with it is, the, I think, with the medications is that they numb emotions to some extent. All psychiatric drugs kind of impair emotional processing. And in, in fact, um, you know, Peter Kramer, who's a psychiatrist who wrote the book Listening to Prozac, um, in that book, he said, you know, I noticed that my, my patients on Prozac lo lose their conscience, that they lose their caring. Uh, he didn't think that that was much of a problem, um, apparently. But, you know, I would say that, you know, we really need to be able to use our emotions um, to live our lives. And uh, our, I mean, basically, our emotions are more important than our thoughts in terms of helping us live our lives, you know, because they tell us what's important, what we want, what we don't want, what we're afraid of, what we want to get rid of what we don't want to do again. And so it's, you know, the fact that psychiatric drugs tend to, to numb emotions, I think is, is somewhat of a problem. You know, mental illnesses, what we call mental illnesses are states of being, right? They're states of being. How am I, uh, how am I feeling? Mental illnesses are states of being, moods, behaviors, thoughts, right? Uh, I believe that all mental illnesses are how people are, are reacting to their lives, to their life situations. There's nothing mysterious about them. It, it, you know, over the last 30 years, we've got this idea that they're kind of mysterious and alien. They just come on people or it's a brain disorder, genetics. It just come on. No, 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 no. The best way to understand mental illnesses, is this is how people are surviving. All mental illnesses, all of them, depression, anxiety, panic disorder, agoraphobia, obsessive compulsive disorder, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. These are all ways in which people are surviving, trying to find a way to live. If we want to help people, the best thing we can do, and this is what therapists ought to be doing, and this is what we ought to do, we, we need to help people uh, go through what they're experiencing. Don't get rid of the symptom. Symptoms there for a reason. What we need to do is help people go through that experience and move towards living their life. And, but you know, everyone everyone has a different way they want to they they want to live their life. Everyone has a different vision of their life, a dream for their life. And so, what therapists need to be doing is helping people live their lives, be motivated, get motivated, uh, and whatever will work: dance, uh, singing. Mindfulness, uh, hypnotherapy. I, I mean, our focus ought to be on helping people move forward with their lives, connecting with other people, using their abilities in a satisfying way, enjoying life. That's what it's, it ought to be about. Forget the symptoms. Well, the symptoms can help people understand themselves, you know? Yeah. So I, <laughs> yes, uh, Jason, right. I have a question. <laughs> so no, I have this, this, uh, I mean, from what you just said, I have this, uh, this, this idea that I just, not everyone who listens to oddball show is, uh, is a, is a psychiatrist or even in the mental health model and believe in a chemical imbalance that right. we are, that there are there's such thing as a chemical imbalance that, um, you are born with a chemical imbalance. Um, in your opinion, in your um, in your medical opinion, in your professional opinion, do you believe that there's such thing as a chemical imbalance? 
I, I do believe that there are such things as chemical imbalances, but I don't think they cause mental illnesses. You know, I'm pretty sure, and there's evidence of this, that, for instance, I was depressed when I was 25 years old, severely depressed, very bad, in very bad shape. Well, I'm, sh I, I'm sure my brain was different than, than it is now. So I get it that, you know, there, there certainly there, there's brain chemistry, there's biochemistry, there's genetics, there's brain function going on. Absolutely. And it's important. But I don't think any of that causes what we call mental illness. I think it's the other way around. I think the state of being, states of being and the behaviors and the moods that we call mental illness, they, that, they cause the physiology. They cause the chemical imbalances. So I'll just give you, I'll, I'll give you two examples, okay? And, and, and since you brought it up, let me tell you that there's no scientific, the, the, certainly there are chemical imbalances and there are genetics going on in the brain function, but there's no evidence that that causes mental illness, that any of that causes depression or causes bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or agoraphobia or panty disorder. There's no evidence of that. There's just an association. So, for instance, they do research that people with schizophrenia, people diagnosed with schizophrenia, they happen to have large ventricles in their brain. They have large ventricles in their brain. But they don't know whether it's the schizophrenia that caused the large ventricles or the large ventricles caused the schizophrenia. They don't know that. So let me tell you what I think. There's a, there's a, there's a, um, there's a scientific principle called uh, parsimony. And the principle that goes like this, if you have a finding, for instance, you have a finding, you find that people diagnosed with schizophrenia uh, have large ventricles. Now, if you want to see if you can get some idea about what causes what, if you're interested in knowing, what, is it the schizophrenia that causes the large ventricles in the brain, or is it the large ventricles that causes schizophrenia, right? One thing you can do is go look at what we do know about similar dynamics. Okay, mind-body dynamics. The dynamic we know most about, most studied, is the stress response. Jason, the stress response is, is an incredible physiological response. More blood being pumped, more oxygen in the blood, uh, blood flow in the, in the extremities restricted, pain threshold goes up, uh, norepinephrine, noradrenaline, other endocrine secreted, so I'm stronger, I'm smarter, Blood's going to the heart, the muscles, and the brain, not to the digestive organs. This is a total body thing going on in the stress response. Well, it didn't just happen, right? The stress response happens because you perceive the threat. You perceive the threat, and you think that threat is real. That's a psychological event that went on. That's triggered the physiology, right? So the same is true of blushing. Blushing just doesn't happen. Blushing happens because you get embarrassed. That's huh. a psychological thing. I get embarrassed. Oh, the blood rushes to my to my face. So I think that the causality goes the other way. It goes, it doesn't go from the physiology to the to, to the psychological. It goes from the psychological state to the physiology. I'll give you another example. This is this is really interesting to me. I read a book by a guy named Sir John Eccles, right? And the whole book is about how is it that I move my arm at the count of three, right? So I go one, two, three. One, two, three. Well, that was weird. <laughs> two, two, three. Jason, we don't know how that happens. This guy writes a whole book, Sir John Eccles. We know, uh, you know, we know something about the physiology. We know about the ligaments and the muscles and the nerve connections between the brain and the arm. What we don't know is how a psychological event, me saying three, enables me to move my arm. We don't know how, we don't know how that happens. And he thought, he thinks it's a quantum, some kind of quantum dynamic. I don't understood. It's the, it's the psychological event that occurred that triggers that, right? Anything yeah. you do voluntarily, you know? Like I decide I'm gonna serve a tennis ball. I decide I'm going to serve a tennis ball, right? And then I do it. How the hell does that happen? 
Yeah. So I read um I read uh the uh, Power of Habit and I also read the Atomic Habits and um I thought that they were great books about explaining habits um and yeah. sometimes we can just do stuff by habit and a habit is just something that you do on a regular basis that you don't think about anymore that you literally train yourself to not think about whether it's just right. turning on a light switch when you go upstairs you don't think about it you just do it. Um, some people, right. um, you know, in the book, it says, uh, you know, you'll be driving home and all of a sudden, I think it was the power of habit. The person had part of their brain removed and still remembered how to get back to their house. I mean, the brain is incredibly powerful and, and you know, it can, it can relearn and it can learn, um, in my opinion. And what I've read is, what do you think about that? Like the idea of, you know, flipping on a light switch, you don't think about it, you just do it. Right. Yeah, well, the brain, while well, you talk about the brain, the brain. I love the brain, Al. I love the brain. The brain is a fascinating subject. Now, what's also fascinating is the relationship between the brain and the mind, about Jason, because I, I will say it this way. I don't think I live my life with my brain. I don't think I do. I think I live my, my life with my mind. Now you're going to ask me, what's the difference between the brain and the mind? I don't know. And nobody else knows. But let me tell you, there was a book by a guy named William Uttle. I read this book, William Uttle, U-T-T-A-L. He died, he died about three years ago. It's called Brain and Mind, A Critique of Neuroscience. And basically what he said, and he was a neuroscientist himself. He said, neuroscientists think they have a theory of how the brain creates the mind. They have no kind of theory. They, they aren't even close to a theory. They are so far from having a theory about how the brain creates the mind, and they maybe never will. So think about it this way, uh, uh, Jason. The, or, uh, the brain is an organ, a piece of protoplasm, billions of neurons, trillions of connections, the most complicated organ in, in the universe, right, that we know of, right? But it's an organ. The mind is, is a fact. The mind is what we use to live our lives. It's what we use to create everything we create, to build things, to create art, to connect with other people, to ski, to play tennis. The mind is this incredible faculty we use to live our lives. Neuroscientists don't know how that goes. How, how to, they don't know anything about the relationship between the brain and the mind. For instance, they don't know what's going on differently in my brain from when, let's say, when I'm having an insight Oh, the reason I need approval from men, the reason I need so much approval from men is because my father wounded me. My father mm -hmm. treated me badly. Oh, that's an insight. They don't know what's going on in the brain when that happens compared with when I'm um, uh, making uh, making hotel reservations or getting a rental car or going on. They have no idea. Wow. That's a really interesting concept because... If if you think about it, when when you were talking about the brain body connection, I, I'm wondering if you can talk about your professional opinion. What is the benefit of what would you say uh, meditation? Let's talk about meditation. What is the benefit of meditation on the mind? I think that the benefit of meditation on the mind is that it enables a person to get below the noise, and some people never do it. You know, there's all this noise going on. Right. What am I going to do tomorrow? Uh, gee, I hope I do well with Jason today. I want to be the best interviewer he ever had in his life. He might be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Just joking. <laughs> There's all this shit going on. You know, uh, you, you know, what am I going to eat tomorrow? Uh, uh, holy shit. Um, you know, I got to put some money in a money market because I, I'm not earning enough with a bank. I'm only getting 1% interest. Uh, you, you, you know, my patient's coming in tomorrow and I don't know what to do. When you meditate, if you're able to do it, you're able to go down, go down, 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 down and get underneath all of that noise. And if you can do that, some thoughts are going to come up that maybe never came up before. You're, you're going to get access to a different part of your psyche. Jason, the psyche, the psyche is in... It's fascinating. You know, you've heard about terms like the unconscious, uh, deep structure, core material. I have. I have because I read The Mindful Consciousness, which was a brilliant book. Um, 
and I don't want to be like, hey, what does this mean? Because my listeners don't understand. But consciousness, real quick, just what is consciousness? Well, I mean, consciousness is is our is our experience of being alive and being able to use our minds and feel our emotions. Our, our experience of being alive. Now, it's it's really clear that there's a lot of material. There, 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 there's stuff going on. There are beliefs, assumptions, uh, attitudes, habits that are going on beneath the surface, right? And, and, and we, we may not be aware of them. If we're, awful, we're not aware of them. We're not aware of that stuff. But it's still going on. You know how Freud learned about this? The way Freud learned about the unconscious was Freud listened to people. He, he, Freud, Freud spent all of his life listening to people, watching people, spending time with people. He said, you know, what's interesting is people make mistakes. They make mistakes of speaking, of hearing, of listening, of forgetting, of losing things. They make mistakes and you know, they're not random. There's a pattern to those mistakes. There's a pattern. So there must be something going on underneath that we don't know. Well, this is one of the scariest things about being alive. The fact that there are forces in my psyche that are deep underneath my consciousness that drive my behavior that I'm not aware of. So one of the things that therapy can help people with is they can help people become aware of that stuff through dreams, through meditation, ideas coming up. But let me give you an example of, of, of and in a way this is habit. You know of people who are always late, right? Virtually 100% of the time. I belong to a Quaker uh, meeting uh, here. And, you know, the Quaker meeting, you sit for an hour just in silence. Well, there, there, there is a woman who comes, she always comes 15 minutes late. She's probably not aware of what the reason for that is. Because if you're always late, there's something going on underneath. So you ask me, what, what's a possibility? Well, one possibility is I'm going to make you wait for me. I'm not going to wait for you. Another possibility is I'm very busy. I'm very busy. You're not as busy as I am. Another possibility is I want to make an entrance. I want people to notice me. So I come in 15 minutes later, everybody notices me. Another reason is I really don't want to be there. there. But there's some reason. If someone is always late, there's some reason, Jason. Yeah, that's an example of a, you know, it's a slip. I can give you some stories of my life, things that I did. In most cases, they were things that hurt me. Uh, yeah, I've been there now. Believe me, I've been there. Well, and, and, I, I'm yeah. a half the age, but I've been there. I've done a lot, you know. I mean, okay. So some of those things, you know, believe me, I didn't want them to happen. I, I, that was not driven by my conscious intent. It was driven by something deeper than that. Do you think so? You think like you were driven by like dark forces or like light forces or something, but something drove you to do whatever you did. Like when, and, and that's the, the idea of psychosis or For that's sure. just the well, idea of the, the, who you are as a person. Well, actually the, the guy who knew the most about psychosis would answer your question. Yes. That was John Weir Perry. John Weir Perry was a psychologist who was, who was working in, um, he was working in California in the 1950s. He spent a lot of time with people diagnosed with schizophrenia, and he wanted to understand what was going on psychically. Here's what he decided. You have a person who's been rejected, hurt. They're about to reach adulthood. They're about to have to take on the expectations and the responsibilities of adulthood. They're terrified of the world and of human beings for a good reason. For a good reason. The world has been hurtful. Human beings have been hurtful. So their psychic energy attaches to a more powerful part of themselves, a deeper part. So he was a Jungian analyst, so he would talk in terms of archetypes. So, you know, the archetypes are these uh, images or these personalities in a way that we all have inside of us. The king, we all have a part of us as the king, the innocent, the wanderer, the magician. Yeah, we all have that inside of us. He says, Al, Al, that's a fascinating uh, idea. Is Did he write a book that you could recommend to my listeners? Read the Far Side of Madness by, by John Weir Perry. What he came to see is, that, you know, 
the psychic energy attaches to this deeper part that's more powerful, but it's an imaginary part of the self. But the, the psychic energy attaches to that part so the person can survive in the world because it, they have to have a, have a sense of that kind of power in order to survive. And but but it's imaginary and their energy, they don't have any energy to, to run their neocortex, their rational faculty. It's all attached to that deeper part that's imaginary. And so if you if you spend a lot of time with people who are experiencing psychosis, uh, and I found this out, uh, many of them do believe they've been anointed by some divine figure to be involved in this battle between good and evil. I had a patient who uh, I knew for five years in, in, in Colorado, uh, and she basically definitely could be diagnosed with schizophrenia. She had been hurt, horribly hurt in her life, abused every way you can imagine. Her kids had been taken away from her. By the way, she could be lucid when she needed to be grounded and lucid, she was. Oh yeah, if she was applying for welfare, oh no, my name is such and such. I was born such and such at number. If she was talking to a policeman, oh no, very grounded. When she was in my office, she would say all kinds of delusional things. So one day she says to me, I was christened by the first Pope. I said, really? Wait a second, the first Pope lived 1500 years ago. Oh no, no, I mean, I was christened by the Pope, that this Pope. Well, see, I didn't know then what I know now, Jason, but if I had known then what I know now, I would have asked her, well, you know, it's interesting that the Pope christened you because the Pope doesn't christen everybody. Why is it that the Pope christened you? She said, because I'm important to the Pope. I'm a part of the Pope's team. So here's another, just another example. I, I was driving with a kid, 18 year old kid. This is in Colorado also. Was this um, uh, a, a a peer support thing? You know, these are my patients. Your patients? Oh, you drove with a patient. Okay, cool. I did. I drove with a patient. That seems like a really cool, cool. I mean, you seem like a very cool psych psychiatrist, right. you know. Or uh... and so Terry, the staff, they would go everywhere with the patients. They go to bars. They they go to movies. They go to shows, music shows. They go to their appointments with them. That's fascinating. Let me just say that I really do feel that Soteria houses, I really hope that they catch on because it's a fascinating uh, healing. It just sounds like incredibly healing. Yeah. It's terrific. But if you want to, if you want to read a good book, if you want to read a good book on Soteria, here's a, here's a great book. I got it right here. Here it is. It's called Soteria Through Madness to Deliverance. It's by Lauren Mosier, who was the psychiatrist who started it. And a guy named Voice Hendricks, who actually was actually was a cousin of Jimi Hendrix. No way! Come on. Yeah, Voice Hendricks. Yeah, no, he was. That's and so he cool. Was the house manager. <laughs> he was the house manager at Soteria. So, but so I'm I'm driving with this 18 year old kid. He's he's abused. He's been abused by his mother's boyfriends. Right. One of those stories you've heard it a thousand times. And and and, and we're we're driving along, and he says he says to me, "You see that guy in the corner?" I said, "Yeah." He says he's reading my mind. He's he's got he's got a device that's reading my mind. So I asked him, I say, why is he reading your mind? He says, because I'm important. They both said I'm important to you. Yeah. This is what John Weir Perry found. He said there's a pattern to people who go through psychosis. There's some patterns. They they, they regress back to an earlier time in their life, rebirth. Very many of them are connected to some kind of divine. Presence. They've been anointed by a divine presence to be involved in an important battle between good and evil, God and the devil, communism and democracy. Well, it's interesting, you know, when, when someone tells you that, you know, somebody, somebody has implanted a device and they're reading their mind, it's never their next door neighbor or the barber. It's the trilateral commission, uh, the Illuminati, right? Because they're important. Big energy went to a more powerful part of themselves so they could survive. You know, you've been through the experience and and recovered and recovering. You, you have this experience and so you know, you know what helped. I mean, and I know really? meditation can help too, but it had to be, there had to be something more, well, really what John Weir Perry would say was that it, it, what really people need is to be connected to other people. I don't know about your wife, 
She's probably yeah. a saint. <laughs> she, she deals with me. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. But you know, if you look back, being connected to other people, you know what helped me when I was really depressed? It was really weird. I went to a classically trained psychoanalyst. And so I lay on the couch and say everything that comes to my mind. He's behind me here. And I'm unloading shit. I mean, I'm 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 unloading all the ways in which I feel inadequate. I'm weak. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good looking enough. I can't satisfy my wife sexually. I want to kill my father. I, I, I'm a piece of shit. You know, I'm scared. I'm fucking scared. And all I hear is this. All I hear. Mm -hmm. Did that, did that help you? Mm -hmm. It helped me in a weird way, Jason, it helped me just unloading this stuff in the presence of a human being is that, Mm -hmm. what else is new yeah yeah would you say just generally being curious about someone uh and, and if someone's telling you something and you're just generally curious about them um that's more impactful than um than saying like i've got the answers for you i don't have the answers for you it's, it's way more helpful especially if if you can help you be curious if you're curious about the experience and you're helping the person delve into it not want to get rid of it, but helping the person delve into it, tell you more about it, how does this work, where does this, and help them then say, oh, so that's who you are. Yeah, it's okay, it's fine, nothing wrong with you. Totally understandable what's going on in view of your life experience, what you've been going through. Oftentimes I've said to a patient, you know, if I could give you one gift, my friend, if I could give you one gift for the rest of your life, it would be the ability to feel bad, just to feel bad, to feel bad. Don't do anything about it. Don't drug, don't drink, don't sex, don't gamble, don't ski, don't do any, just feel bad. Just spend time feeling bad and learn from it. I want to ask, why do you think people should feel bad to feel good, I think is your idea, right? right? Exactly right. In order to feel, I would say it this way, in order to feel good in the long run, you have to be willing to feel bad in the short run. Because when do we feel bad? We feel bad when we've lost something valuable. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really good to know that's valuable. Oh, shit, that's valuable. I want to I want to nurture that and protect it. We feel bad when we screwed up. Well, we all screw up. You know, and, we, and if we feel bad about it, we can we can sort of decide, hey, I'm not going to do that again. I don't want to feel bad. I'm tired of feeling bad. I don't want to do that again. I'm going to get better. We can feel bad because we're angry or, or we're afraid. Well, it, it, it's very good to know what we're afraid of. And if we're angry, it's very good to know what we don't like and what we want to get rid of. All those emotions are very helpful. That's fascinating. You know, everyone talks about gratitude. Um, and, and I think gratitude is incredibly important. Because if I if I lost my dog, I'm gonna I love my dog. I'm gonna feel terrible. Just just noticing the gratitude. Yeah, it's feeling bad like the opposite of gratitude, meaning like feeling bad is actually being grateful because you're like, I am grateful that I'm not feeling bad. So I'm actually trying to make myself feel bad to feel grateful. I think that feeling bad can lead to gratitude. Absolutely. I think it's more like this: the value of feeling bad is that. It tells me how important that dog was to me. I mean, in a real visceral way. Holy shit. That dog was important to me. Really important. And so what that tells you is, you know, for the rest of my life, I'm going to have a pet and I'm going to nurture and protect that pet because that's important to me. When, when you suffer loss and you feel that horrible grief, and pain from it, it tells you, holy shit, that is something that's important to me. And I'm going to nurture and protect that for the rest of my life. I, I think I just had some sort of epiphany that, um, and maybe I haven't, but I lost my nephew five years ago. Um, to, he took his life and it's horrible. And he was 27. He was the brightest bulb I've ever met in my life. He was the best kid. He didn't realize that he was the best kid and he might not have uh, I don't know what actually happened to him because he was far away from home when it happened. 
But all I know is he's no longer here. And although I think about my dog, it actually went to my nephew. So that's kind of weird how your brain actually associates. Hey, I love my living dog. Oh man, I miss my nephew. That's interesting. It's amazing how the mind, how the mind does that. See, because now you know how much that hurt to lose your nephew. Now, well, I'm going to, I'm going to nurture and protect my relationship with my family members, with my, with my family, with my, 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 my friends, you know, that's important to me. Yeah. You know, we're talking about that. Let me say one more thing about the mind and the brain. Okay. It's just, you know, <laughs> thank say, you so much for making me think about my dog and then going to my, my nephew. I didn't even know how that happened. About this, brain. You know, so, so let's say I decided to submit a, pros, a proposal to a conference to make a presentation. I decided to do it. Now, I don't think it was my brain that decided that. My brain, the, the organ, I don't, my, my brain didn't decide to do that. I don't know what I mean when I say I decided to do it. I don't know what the fuck that means. I decided to do it. Okay, I decided. It wasn't my brain that decided. Well, well, Eckhart Tolle says that it's literally, there is no I. There, we're all just kind of stardust in a way, you know? And um, that's a very, very deep thought, you know, like just to think that we don't even exist. Like we're just like a human I mean, some uh, soul having a human experience, which is a fantastic, beautiful concept, if you think about it. When you're talking about, like, what gives people meaning? Yeah. Isn't it having purpose? And isn't it having some sort of hope? And and when I was thinking of what gives me meaning and has always given me meaning is Oddball. Oddball magazine, from the beginning, has given me some sort of purpose. Absolutely. And now, and now Oddball Foundation has given me a greater purpose to get people like you on the show. Um, and right now I'm, I'm, I'm taking off my president hat of oddball foundation. Cause I was supposed to do that when I talk about oddball foundation and oddball show, cause I think it's important, but honestly, um, cause I, I mean, you, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's oddball foundation is this greater yeah. thing that I'm creating. Absolutely. But also I, I'm, I'm a person. So maybe people don't um, agree with what I'm saying, but, uh, and I don't want to like mess up my foundation, which I absolutely love and adore. So well, I, uh, 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 you give me a chance to say two more things. And we did go another 10 minutes. Yeah. Someone asked Sigmund Freud. Okay. Someone asked Sigmund Freud, father of psychology, when he was an older man to say, so Dr. Freud, what's the key to mental health? He said, the key to mental health is the capacity to love and the capacity to work and the capacity to enjoy life. If you can love the way you want to love, and you can work, and and a guy named Matthew Fox changed work to express yourself. You can love the way you want to love, and express yourself the way you want to express yourself, and enjoy life the way you want to enjoy life. You're going to be mentally healthy. I mean, wouldn't you say it's to create, to create something, to actually build upon your own experience and create something that is yeah, I think like so. Awesome. It's a good way of saying it. Well, so the positive psychologist, you know, there's a bunch of Psychologists call him positive psychologist. Martin Seligman is, I guess, the most famous one. He, they, they came down. They said, here are the ingredients of happiness. Okay. First, use the best part of yourself in the interest of something bigger than yourself. Right? Positive relationships and achievement, competence, and mastery. That's what it takes to be happy. And it's very similar to what Freud said. Very similar. That is fantastic. Um, Al, I, I, I so appreciate uh, you being on the show. Um, I feel enlightened. I hope my audience feels enlightened. I can't wait to get this out to uh, people to talk about it. But I, I no, I just want to say um, thank you, Al, for being on the show. Um, I really think it's uh, important that people know about Mind Freedom International. So please let people know how we how they can get involved, especially if they're a nonprofit organization who is on like the you know this mental health um, advocacy tip. How can they connect with you? The, the the best way to connect is go to our website. It's uh, www.mindfreedom.org. www.mindfreedom.org. Go to the website. You can check out, see what we're doing, and you can donate if you want to. We don't have any money. We're really out of money. Well, I hope you get more money. And I think one of the, one of the things is, I mean, I hope someone's listening and like, wow, Al, Al Galv is, uh, Al Galv's, uh, is an amazing uh, person. He's part of amazing uh, Mind Freedom International. And by the way, Mind 
freedom, not brain freedom. And I, exactly. I just put that together. Exactly. I just put that together. Mind freedom. And, and that's beautiful. Um, there thank you, you so much, Al, uh, for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Um, to my listeners, um, are you reading a book right now? And what would you uh, currently? What are you currently reading? And what would you recommend? Uh, I'm reading three books. Oh, cool. Let's hear them. One of them is called Heartland. It's by a woman who grew up in the in Kansas. And it's really about the urban-rural divide in the country and how, and if you want to know why rural people voted for Donald Trump, read that book. Another book I, I'm reading is called The Death of the Liberal Class. By a, 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 It's by a, a journalist named Chris Hedges. It's about how the liberal class abandoned the, the working man and how both parties, uh, basically both parties uh, got into bed with Wall Street and corporations and, and uh and Abandon the Working Man. And the third book is a book called Plague of Doves by Louise Erdrich. Louise Erdrich uh, writes about Native Americans and great books. And her latest book is called Night Watchman. Hmm. And it's, it's, I guess it's a terrific book. Uh, anyway, the one I'm reading is called Plague of Doves by, by Louise Erdrich. The book I'm currently reading right now is Mind Fixers um, by Anne Harrington. Um, I absolutely, I absolutely 100% recommend this book to the, uh, listeners and the, um, and the viewers, mind fixers, psychiatry's trouble search for the biology of mental illness by wow. Anne Harrington. And it is, uh, it is phenomenal. Uh, I am learning so much and it is, uh, all too, all too grim of a story. Yeah. It is a grim story. Actually it is. It's a very sad story and a grim story. Yeah, but Al, I mean, now uh, I feel like I want people to take away from this that, yes, right now we're talking about psychiatry, but we're also just talking about like emotion, mental health, meditation, and all sorts of cool stuff that you don't have to actually equate with psychiatry, but it's more of like well-being. Exactly. You know? It's living your life. That's what it's all about. It's all about living your life the way you want to live it. And if you can't do it, you're going to become mentally ill. See, that's what all mental illness is about, people's lives. That's fascinating, Al. Yeah. Um, I, I, I appreciate you, Al, for being on the show. Thank you. Um, I hope uh, you are well. And um, everybody, this has been the Oddball Show. Um, my guest is Al Galves, um, the president of Mind Freedom International. Oh, Al, I really had a blast. And just uh, people... Um, Check out Mind Freedom International's uh, mission. Get behind uh, Soteria Houses. Uh, this is a really beautiful uh, part of, uh, you know, people who uh, are in the mental health system that are like, you know, like a, a new way of how we can do things. So let's exactly. get behind it, you know. And yeah. um, thank you, Al, for being on the show. Um, and this has been an You're Oddball welcome. Show. You're welcome. Bye, Jason. Yeah. Have a good night. I hope you just enjoyed this interview with Al Galves because I really did. Um, Al Galves is the president of Mind Freedom International. Um, and that was an incredibly enlightening uh, interview. Um, I hope that you enjoy what you hear um, from him. I hope you really uh, want to uh, support Mind Freedom International and also know what Soteria Houses are. I mean, that's the goal. Um, and also I hope you got something from this podcast. I certainly did. And I always do feel like we're perpetual students. We're always learning. And, um, when we stop learning, then we stop growing. So my goal is to constantly be a student. Um, cause you know, everybody has a story. And honestly, I, I think that, you know, the most beautiful thing about us is our story. Uh, and it's all original, you know, every single one of us has our own story not the story that people have thought of of who you are but your own story my name is jason wright um this has been oddball show um i hope you're well um if you like uh, what we're doing i'm gonna put on my president hat for a second i am the president of oddball foundation uh, a 501c3 for mental health advocacy uh, please consider donating to us so we, you can learn more about our mission of mental health advocacy through creative mediums like Oddball Magazine, Oddball Show, and community collaborations. Thanks so much for listening, and have a great night, and uh, read a book. Bye. If you liked what you heard in this episode, learned something new, and want to stay up to date on what's going on with Oddball Show, please consider liking this episode and leaving a review. 
subscribe to Oddball Show on YouTube, Buzzsprout, or wherever you get your podcasts. And check out oddballmagazine.org for more fascinating stories, poetry, and art. Thanks for listening.